look a little more in depth at each of these parts of the anatomy and talk just a bit about what they do and uh, what is uh, really important to know about them. The extensor digitorum carminis muscle tendon units, as we know, originate proximally uh, in the forearm, proceed through the dorsal retinaculum, and insert at the metacarpophalangeal joints of the fingers. Alongside the extensor digitorum communis tendons to the fingers is the extensor indices that is specifically for the index finger and also the extensor digiti minimi somewhat more separate that goes to the little finger. Here we're looking at a cross section of the dorsal retinaculum and we're looking at the fourth compartment which houses the four extensor digitorum communis tendons to the fingers as well as the extensor indices. But the little finger has its own separate compartment in number five for the extensor digiti minimi. Because of the very dorsal and central location of these tendons at the level of the wrist, wrist range of motion has a significant effect on these extrinsic extensor tendons. If we look underneath these muscles that have been cut away in this illustration, we see that the extensor indices actually is a relatively short muscle and does not originate from as far proximally. The highlighted pink muscles are the muscles that are moving the thumb and they too are not as long and thus do not have the same excursion as those of the extrinsic finger extensors. Here is the anatomy, the dorsal retinaculum retaining the extrinsic extensor tendons to the fingers and the, this illustrates beautifully the flattened broad shape of these tendons as they move over the dorsum of the hand. This also shows the acute angle of the extensor to the thumb as well as the junctura tendini that connect the extensor tendons on the dorsum of the hand. The extensor digiti minimi and the extensor indices, if you look carefully, will always be on the ulnar side of the, of the extensor digitorum communis tendon to the same finger. In this example, there is a distinct extensor digitorum communis tendon to the little finger. In some cases, it is not as obvious. Here we see tension in the extensor indices because the other fingers are flexed and we see that it has the exact same function as the extensor digitorum communis would have. There's tension here across the metacarpal phalangeal joint. We do see tension here but as it approaches the PIP joint we lose that distinction and we note that there now is lateral band tension extending the finger. Here in this uh, exquisite surface anatomy we see the tension of the extensor indices and we know that's the indices because the other fingers are flexed. That tension crosses the metacarpal phalangeal joint and continues but then we begin to lose it as it moves toward the PIP joint. But what do we see? We see the lateral band tension contributing to this finger clearly. And you may recall that early in this presentation we talked about how the lateral fibers are tense in extension, the central fibers are tense in flexion. Here is the perfect demonstration of that. Now as we talk about the role of the EDC or extensor digitorum communis, keep in mind that I more than likely will not again refer to the extensor indices or the extensor digiti minimi. And the reason I will not is their functions are absolutely identical to the EDC. Therefore, if I say EDC or extensor digitorum communis, you can, ex you can assume that that same would apply to both of these independent tendons. Here we're looking at two hands. They're slightly different views. This is more dorsal and here we're looking at the proximal phalanges. But what we're looking at is the junctura. In this example, the ring finger 
has a junctura that comes over, and that is the extensor digitorum communis contribution. We don't see a distinct EDC tendon. We see the extensor digiti minimi. But here, in this slide, we see that there is a discrete EDC tendon that's separate from the ring finger, and that contribution is equal to the extensor digiti minimi. Another perfect example of the variability of anatomy, but the result is nevertheless the identical function. In this photograph, I am actually pulling with a gloved hand on the extensor digitorum communis. Now, obviously a cadaver does not have any muscle tension, so there's no counteracting muscle tension whatsoever. But in pulling on the extensor digitorum communis, you see that the metacarpophalangeal joint is extended, but the PIP joint is, nor the DIP joint are fully extended. This demonstrates perfectly, in my view, the role of the metacarpophalangeal joint in extension from the power of the EDC. And that is that the EDC power is used up at the MP joint and there's very little left at the PIP joint. I would ask this rhetorical question. How many insertions of the extensor digitorum communis go into the dorsal apparatus? Or I should say, how many times does the extensor digitorum communis insert within the dorsal apparatus? Well, let's take a look at that. The EDC, technically, you could say, has four insertions. We've already talked about the sagittal band. There is a proximal phalanx insertion that is highly variable. We've talked about the central slip insertion and the terminal tendon insertion. So there are four places along the dorsum of the finger that the extensor digitorum communis power extends and inserts. This does not mean that only the EDC inserts here. The sagittal band insertion we've already discussed, where the fibers go around the joint and insert into the volar plate. Now think about these four locations illustrated in red. In each location, the dorsal apparatus is tethered down, preventing excessive proximal or distal motion. The fact that the sagittal band arises from the volar plate and the volar plate has no proximal or distal excursion means that the sagittal band limits the excursion of the EDC. The proximal phalanx insertion we'll look at in more detail. It's not only variable anatomically, but it doesn't really come into active use it, unless the finger is in hyperextension. We've looked at the, the central slip insertion, and the very interesting thing to note is if I had a cadaver finger, I went underneath the dorsal apparatus and I incised the central slip insertion. I disconnected it, but I did not cut a hole in the dorsal apparatus. If I did that on a cadaver or a live human being, in both circumstances, finger motion would be normal. We'll discuss that again. The final insertion we've agreed is the terminal tendon insertion. It combines EDC along with the entire dorsal apparatus. So these four insertions tether down the dorsal apparatus. And although there is a connection of the extensor digitorum communis in all locations, one cannot say that this is the insertion of the EDC because it is not just the EDC. It is a combination of lumbrical, interossei, and EDC. If we pull proximally on the extensor digitorum communis tendon, we will create a line of pull that is across the sagittal bands that will extend the MP joint, and when the MP joint is extended, then the power will continue onward 
And the first line of pull before uh, it's able to continue to the central slip insertion is via the conjoined lateral bands to the lateral band, which then goes to the terminal tendon insertion. Another way to think about this would be that there is no direct route of extensor digitorum communis power to the terminal tendon insertion. That tension that the EDC contributes must go around the PIP joint via the lateral band in order to reach the terminal tendon insertion. Here we see it in this illustration that the extensor digitorum communis power would go laterally, coalesce again, and insert distally. Any time a line of force changes angle, there is some diminution in its power. Therefore, we don't see that anyone has very much power at the terminal tendon insertion. Mm -hmm.